What's going on everyone? Welcome back. Patrick here and moving on to the next video. We got to solve this limit here. We got the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times cos bracket x plus 2 all over x. So notice this is a pretty complex function we're working with. We're pretty much mixing a parabola and a trig function. And to solve this limit, we're actually going to be using the squeeze theorem. And so I rewrote the squeeze theorem over here so we can refer to it throughout the question. And I'm going to be solving this question and talking about the squeeze theorem with the assumption that you've already watched the squeeze theorem overview video. So if you haven't watched that video, make sure you do before watching this one or you might get a little bit confused. So we got the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times cos bracket x plus 2 all over x. And notice that we can't make a direct substitution of 0 in this function. Why? Well, because of this x over here in the denominator. Notice that if we plug in 0 here, we're going to be taking something dividing by 0. We can't do that, unfortunately. So we're going to have to do something else. Now, if you remember in the squeeze theorem overview video, I mentioned that sometimes this g of x here is going to be a complex function that perhaps we don't know how to, how to graph or we don't know how the graph looks like. And this is an example of that. So this is like that complex function. And what we can try to do is we can try to find two other functions, f of x and h of x, for which this function is going to be bounded in between. So to do that, I actually want to do a quick review of how the cos x graph looks like. And in general, the cos x graph always fluctuates between positive 1 and negative 1. So it starts here and comes back up, goes down, comes back up, etc. Just, it's just a wave that continues on to positive infinity and to negative infinity. But it's always fluctuating between positive 1 and negative 1. And knowing that characteristic of cos x, that's what we're actually going to use here. So notice that cos x fluctuates between positive 1 and negative 1. But if you think about it, anything that you put in this bracket, cos of that is always going to be between positive 1 and negative 1. Because that outer function is going to stay the same. Cos is still going to stay the same. So no matter what is here, in the bracket, so I'm going to put anything there, this is always going to be between positive 1 and negative 1. So um, let's write that down. So we got cos of anything, any expression, actually let's not put anything, let's just put cos of an expression. It's always going to be less than or equal to 1, greater than or equal to negative 1. Now, in, depending on what the expression is here, it might not always reach positive 1, might not always reach negative 1, but it can never go past those values. Right? So cos of any expression is always going to be less than 1, greater than or equal to negative 1. Now, if we start adding something in front of the cos, like if we put a 5 there or whatever, then this doesn't hold anymore. So that cos, there can't be anything in front of it, and we can't be adding or subtracting anything to it. So that's another point I want to make. It always has to be, anything that changes has to be within that bracket. And same thing for sine. So we're not working with sine in this question, but Sine, as we know, fluctuates between positive 1 and negative 1 as well. So sine of any expression is always going to be between negative 1 and positive 1. Okay, so if we know that cos of any expression is between negative 1 and positive 1, well, if we bring this cos in, that means that cos of x plus 2 all over x can never be greater than positive 1, can never be less than negative 1. 
Okay, so those are the max and min values of just this portion. And so what we can do now is we can add in this x squared. So if we add in the x squared over here, in the middle, notice that we multiplied the x squared into the middle. So we've got to multiply the x squared on the ends as well. So 1 times x squared is going to be x squared. And then negative 1 times x squared is going to be negative x squared. So this function here is always going to be bounded by negative x squared. So always going to be greater than or equal to negative x squared, but less than or equal to positive x squared. Okay, and you could see that here. So this square bracket, its max value can be positive 1. Its min value can be negative 1. So if it takes its max value, positive 1 times x squared is positive x squared. If this square bracket takes its minimum value of negative 1, negative 1 times x squared is going to be negative x squared. Right? So it always has to be between those two functions. So if I, uh, if I take this, actually, let's rewrite it up here just to give myself some room. Now notice that we took that function and we bounded it by two other functions. And notice that those two other functions are a lot more simple to work with than this. We know how x squared looks like. We know how negative x squared looks like. Okay, so let's go through the theorem. If f of x is less than or equal to g of x, which is less than or equal to h of x. So notice this is like the f of x. This is like the g of x. This is like the h of x for x values near a. And the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of h of x, and both of those are equal to the same value. Well, notice that the limit as x approaches 0, that's what we're approaching in our limit question of f of x, so negative x squared. Notice that that is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of h of x, which is x squared. Both of those equal 0. Okay, so x squared we know looks like this parabola that opens up. So as we're approaching 0, what are the y values approaching? They're approaching 0 as well. And then negative x squared, it's just the parabola reflected. It opens down. So notice as we approach this x value of 0 over here, the y values are approaching 0 as well. And so because of this and because of this, we can say now that by the squeeze theorem, that means that the limit as x approaches 0 of that middle function g of x, so this function here, x squared cos of x plus 2 all over x, also has to equal 0. Okay, so the two most important lines that you have to write out in order to get full marks for this question is this line over here. You don't even have to write this h of x here. Let's put that outside of the. Uh, so you got to write that line, and then you got to write this line as well. You pretty much have to rewrite these words, but instead of writing this, you would write this, and instead of writing this, you would rewrite this. And because these two things hold, then by the squeeze theorem, it means the limit as I as x approaches 0 of this function that we were given also has to equal 0. Okay, and the way that this graph actually looks, so you actually don't have to graph this. Um, it's a pretty complex function, and unless you have a graphing calculator on your test, you're not going to be able to. So you got to figure out these limits with the, uh, with the squeeze theorem. But if you're wondering, if you were to take this function, and uh, plot it into Desmos. Actually, you know what? Let's first uh, draw out the x squared and then the negative x squared just to show how it's bounded. 
So this is x squared, this is negative x squared. What happens is this function, um, it kind of like makes a small wave when it starts approaching that zero, small wave, and then it becomes bigger, and then it kind of goes like that. Right, that's how that function looks like approximately if you were to uh, graph it in decimals. I think actually this drops down further before it comes back up. But anyway, notice that this function, it's always going to be bounded by that x squared and negative x squared. And then here, because it's always bounded by those two functions, and at that x value is zero, those two functions have the same y value, it means that um, there's going to be a hole there for this function, but it's going to approach that y value of zero, okay, right there. And so that ends up being the limit for this uh, function, and we use the squeeze theorem to uh, solve this. So notice we didn't really do any algebra here. It's kind of a theoretical way, quote unquote, to uh, solve this limit. And uh, usually the limits that you're going to be using squeeze theorem on are usually going to have a trig function attached to them. And it's usually going to be sine or cos, just because they're both going to have that maximum or minimum value of positive one and negative one respectively. And then you can just bound those, uh, that function that you're working with, with uh, more simple functions in order to use the squeeze theorem.